Mike McCracken, you gave some lectures at Sandia Lab in the early 1980s on global climate change. And if you're giving the same lecture today, how would it be different? <coughs> Thank you. Late in the 19th century, it was recognized by some uh, geologists that carbon dioxide was a component of the atmosphere that could, indu could have possibly induced some, poss some past climatic changes. It wasn't recognized quite then that man would have an influence, but then about 50 years ago, uh, calendar suggested that man's emissions could actually be having an influence. That was dismissed, although some of you may have remembered reading when you were young, or I remember when I was young, uh, reading in Popular Science and Popular Mechanics how CO2 was warming the world and, and uh, we were going to melt ice caps and things. Well, to summarize basically the, the carbon cycle aspects of it, um, this was a point made, as I say, 25 years ago, that we're, we're, we're doing something that hasn't been done before. Even now, man may be unwittingly changing the world's climate through the waste products of his civilization. Due to our release through factories and automobiles every year of more than six billion tons of carbon dioxide, which helps air absorb heat from the sun, our atmosphere seems to be getting warmer. Well, I guess the first thing to say was at the time I was a advisor to the Department of Energy's sort of carbon dioxide research program. So there was an interagency program started. So I, had, I was trying to represent the views of the broad scientific community. Uh, many of the things are the same way. We knew the CO2 concentration was going up. So you see a gradual increase in the annual average from about 315 parts per million to it's up at 340 now, about. Uh, CO2 has probably been very high um, in past geologic times, but certainly not in past historic times. And so we're really doing a giant experiment. And, and the question is, what is the outcome going to be? This is the strangest season many folks can remember. Records that have lasted more than 100 years are not only being broken, they're being absolutely smashed. As so many of us know, this is spring gone wild. Overnight, twisters were tearing through the heartland. In the east, more than 1,300 heat records were broken in one week. It has turned traditional seasons upside down. It has set thousands of new records. In terms of the last thousand years, however, we've been in a relatively warm period. There was a, what was called the Little Ice Age. It was kind of cool um, several hundred years ago, and then during the Viking period, it was as, almost as warm as it is at present. The temperature reconstruction that Dr. McCracken was referring to in 1982 came from a report by the U.S. National Academy of Science, published in 1975. The results are not far off of our current understanding. In the last decade, multiple studies using a variety of techniques have confirmed a temperature rise in recent decades unprecedented in at least the last 2,000 years. We'd identified the fingerprint approach, that is to look at the type of patterns that would emerge from different kinds of factors, whether greenhouse gases or solar or volcanoes. The, the basic way of isolating the, the CO2 change then that we've got to come up with is to try and look at the CO2 results and try and basically develop a fingerprint for carbon dioxide. What are the things that have to occur due to carbon dioxide increase and the, and the resulting climate change that are different from what happens when you have changes in solar radiation or other kinds of things? If, if there was an increase in solar radiation, the stratosphere would warm because ozone would absorb more radiation and the surface would warm because it would be more sort of visible energy getting to the surface. With greenhouse gases, the lower atmosphere warms, but the upper atmosphere cools. What happens in the upper atmosphere is, with more CO2, and it's so, uh, the atmosphere being so thin, it can just sort of radiate more effectively to space, and so the stratosphere cools. And so you were looking for a different trend. When you look for the stratosphere cooling and the surface warming, that would be greenhouse gases and not solar. So that was the first one. The second one is to look for some polar amplification. Indeed, what, what you're getting is amplified changes in polar regions. Most of the warming is occurring in high latitudes, and not much is happening in the tropics. Um, part of this, of course, is going to be due to you have so much ocean in the tropics that that sort of buffers the temperature change. But there, there it, has, it really does seem to occur in the real world that you're getting an amplification of the temperature change in high latitudes. 
Over the last century, estimates of the amount of warming to be expected from a doubling of CO2 in the atmosphere have remained remarkably consistent. The present National Academy estimate, which just came out in a report, came out in a National Academy report in mid-July, is still three plus or minus one and a half degrees for a doubling. The most recent report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, contains estimates of climate sensitivity very close to those of 30 years ago, with the best estimate in the range of three degrees centigrade. If we increase two to three degrees, which is what is projected if one doubles CO2, in terms of uh, man's history, being two to three degrees warmer is sort of going to be an unprecedented event. The last time it was two to three degrees Celsius warmer than it is now, sea level was about 25 meters higher. That's 80 feet. Now that wouldn't happen instantly, but we could get several meters of sea level rise in one century. And potentially we can see the seas coming up somewhere between three and six feet in the 21st century. And these changes look very small, the equivalent of 1% of the solar constant here and about half a percent at the surface. The total energy imbalance now is about six tenths of a watt per square meter. That may not sound like much, but when added up over the whole world, it's enormous. It's equivalent to exploding 400,000 Hiroshima atomic bombs per day, 365 days per year. One of the most critical issues of climate science was already well understood in 1982, that the warming from added CO2 would lead to still more warming from a variety of climate feedbacks. What most people don't know is that of the several degrees Celsius warming that's predicted for the next century, um, only about a third of that comes from direct warming by carbon dioxide. Two thirds of that come from these uh, amplifying effects that we call feedbacks. Increased water in the atmosphere will lead to more capture of solar radiation because water absorbs solar radiation and more trapping of the infrared radiation because water like CO2 traps the outgoing radiation. And this process will feed back on itself. As the climate warms, you evaporate more water from the oceans and that increases the amount of humidity in the atmosphere. And since water itself is a greenhouse gas, that introduces additional warming. Water vapor by itself about doubles the response that you get from carbon dioxide alone. So you add carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, you get direct warming from that, and then you get about an equal amount of warming from this amplification by water vapor. So if you reduce the amount of, of, of radiation reflected from the surface so that more is absorbed. So if you reduce the amount of sea ice, more radiation is absorbed in the ocean. The Arctic Ocean actually functions as kind of like a mirrored hat up on the surface of the Earth. And as that ice begins to decrease and melt away, that sunlight encounters dark ocean where it gets absorbed and begins to heat the ocean up. So now it's 30 years later. Um, we haven't done a whole lot to address this. Are you surprised? Uh, disappointed. Um, I mean, and, and becoming very worried about what, how fast it's occurring. I mean, what's, what's been evident in the impacts and the changes is they're occurring faster than we projected they would. We're seeing the sea ice disappearing in the Arctic faster than the models are projecting. If we look at our climate models, they all say that as you increase your greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, you're going to lose that ice cover. This is just an example of um, 15 climate models used in the IPCC report that Andy mentioned. And the black line is average of all those 15 models. The dotted black line is one standard deviation from that mean. The red here is the observations. We are seeing parts of a, a larger and a, a trend which is rather more rapid than we would have predicted, say, 10 years ago. We, what we're finding is that the mass loss rate from Greenland has accelerated in the last decade and, you know, compared to the, the previous, you know, 17 decades. And these glaciers are starting to fall apart much faster than anybody, even two years ago, thought they were going to do there. I have a, a colleague who went home very discouraged to her daughter, 13-year-old daughter, and, uh, and her daughter just heard this disappointment and all this stuff and basically said to her mother, you can't take away my hope. And, and I think we have an obligation to try and see if we can't find a path.